March 15th. Amen. I'm excited and glad to be here. Man, I say that with uh, with excitement with inside of me. I mean, I do. I'm glad. We in First Peter chapter three, it's right before Second Peter. First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. Uh, and let me just mention a few things to you, if I can. Uh, the Scripture teaches us in First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. Can you do that? Can you do that? And those watching online, can you do that? I mean, look at it again. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Now, to set him apart means I understand his birth, I understand his life, I understand his death, his burial and his resurrection. I understand those things in his life. I can, I can look at that and see. Amen. So always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope. Now listen, sometimes people, uh, you want to tell them, I think you should live such a life that people want to ask you. Amen. And they ask you because they see an example that you give, and they see the life that you're living. So they're going to ask you, why are you different? Why are you handling this the way you're handling it? Why are you dealing with, with life a little bit different? You know, because before you'd get mad, your anger would take over, uh, you, you expl- expletives would come, I think that's the word for cuss words, amen, would come out of your mouth, amen. But now I don't see that. So I want to ask you a question. So give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Instead of being mean and belligerent and saying, you ought to know, you was raised up in church, and yada, yada, yada. With gentleness and respect, how can you share with somebody the hope that lies within you? Amen. Because when I, you know, I got, I'm on my way here, and I get a phone call, and it was a young lady at Tensor North Campus. She said, Pastor, can you do my aunt's funeral Thursday? You know, and just, and that happens to me all the time. Well, when I, it was the first thing I asked was, tell me about the gospel in her life. And she said, well, she could read the Bible. She read it every year front to back. She, she had a life like that, and she, she had a love for God. Well, th- that's, the, that's the hope that lies within us. And can you share the hope that lies in, within you? If I gave you opportunity right now to have each one of you pass by, and I'm not going to do it, not going to put you on the spot, but hand you the mic and say, share the hope that you have. You have the hope of what Christ has done in your life. Amen. Do you understand his birth? It's Christmas. Somebody sent me a picture I love this guy to death, but he's dressed in a Santa Claus outfit. And he said, do you mind if I wear this to church Sunday? Well, I'm not a big Santa Claus advocate, if you know. Amen. I think I shot him once. Amen. And my gun was, was not loaded with real bullets. <laughs> you got to check it first before you shoot it. Okay. Uh, but anyway, they, so, and then he, so I, I just rolled back, you funny. And he said, oh, I get it. Never mind. You know, so he knows real quick that I'm not. But, so, but I want to talk about his birth. You know, when you talk about the birth of Christ, there's so many things that are involved in it. And then when you talk about, and the reason why these are so important, and I'm going to tell you why, because it, when I look at stats, and, and, and I don't read them all the time, but 67% believe that the entire story of Christmas is historically accurate. They believe it's accurate. That's 67. Now, you'd hope that'd be 85, 90, 95, but 67%. So you know why I believe it's accurate, that there was a star, a man that, that led the, the wise men, there was, there was a, a place in Bethlehem where Caesar Augustus sent out a taxing, and, and Joseph went there. And, of course, we talked about it on Sunday, the pregnancy of Mary, amen, and Joseph being a devout man and a just man and how he would not put her away. We walked through that on Sunday. So when I read that, I'm thinking, on oh, 67, okay, well, you know, we've only been a country, a nation for 200 years, maybe 67 percent is good. You'd think we'd done a little bit better. But if you walk through it, you'll understand that if Jesus had never been born, people believed that there would be less charity, love, because God is love, amen, and we see love in Christ. There'd be 61% less kindness, because if there's no love, there's no kindness, amen, so people would be belligerent. And if you go to other countries where there is not a Christ-centered, a a gospel preaching, an understanding, you will realize there is less charity. People aren't giving, amen, they're not benevolent. They're not looking after one another. They're not as kind to one another. Amen. They, 
they're, they're, it's all about keeping what they've got. And, and I think about a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries that I'm thinking of right now. Uh, less personal happiness. You know, I can be honest with you. I understand joy. We'll talk about joy here at the end of the message. But, but happy is, you know, there's a lot of good happy things about serving God. Amen. There'd be less tolerance. And tolerance is important in our lives. And learn how, learn how to sometimes just put up with folk. And I'll say this to you. If you, if, um, how, how, how did I say that for years? If you don't mm, choose to tolerate, celebrate. What you choose to tolerate never changes. Yeah, that's one of them I say. So whatever you choose to tolerate never changes. And there are things and people worth tolerating. Amen. They may not change. They may stay the same or not head, but you love them anyway. So you just deal with it. But, you, but then there are things in your own life that you choose not to tolerate anymore. And you start maybe your health, amen, your spiritual awareness, things of that nature, and you start picking up on it. And, uh, and if you just tolerate people, you can't celebrate them. You know, so I like to celebrate people. Amen. I'm not just here to tolerate you. I want to celebrate you. Amen. And then 47% more war. Some said there'd be more, more war had Christ not come. So Peter tells us, do you have this hope? Can you defend this hope? Can you, when you tell people, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Amen. I know I'm going to go be with Jesus. If you know that, amen, and you're confident of that, that's that hope you have within you. The scripture says in Hebrews, it's an anchor to the soul. It, it, and I don't think it anchors us to earth. I think it anchors us to heaven. Amen. It's an anchor that goes above us and not below us. And it, it holds us to our heaven and to think in eternal. Amen. The Lord himself has given you a sign. You know, all Christianity hinge, hinges on two miracles. And if you can disprove these two miracles, you disprove our belief system and our hope. One of them is the resurrection. Another one is the virgin birth. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe he resurrected from the dead. I believe he was in the grave for three days. Amen. And he showed back up. And to many people, he showed signs over and over again, historically and biblically. And I say biblically because I believe the Bible is history. Amen. And then the virgin birth. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you throw away the virgin birth, you missed it. Isaiah says this, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a son. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. That is pretty explicit. I mean, it, it's, it didn't just throw an idea out there, hey, someday a woman's going to give birth and his, his name's going to be Jesus. It doesn't say that. Amen. First, it tells us she's going to be a virgin. Amen. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I think it's on this, sis. I hope it is. Amen. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Amen. The virgin will be with child. It will give birth to a son. So it's not going to be a girl. We're going to have a boy here. A virgin is going to have it. And you're going to call his name Manuel, which is interpreted God with you. Now, a sign, a sign is the word oath. It's a signal. It's a, it's a flag. Amen. You know, I'm a football lover. So if somebody throws a flag, I'm paying attention to it. If the laundry's on the turf, I'm looking at it. When that flag goes out, it says, pay attention to what's fixing to happen. So he said here, it's going to be a sign. It's going to be a flag. Amen. It's going to be a beacon. It's a monument. It's an omen. Be a, pay attention because this is the thing. So when Mary, when we talked about it on Sunday, shows up and Joseph finds out she's pregnant, he also knows she's a virgin. And being a virgin who's pregnant, now everything shifts in his life. But we also understand that this is a, a fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So God prophetically painted, portrayed, and pictured in advance the immaculate conception of Jesus. Amen. For your faith to hang on. So when I think about it, when I'm able to give that hope to people, I say it, he was born of a virgin. Now, the flip side of that is this. Mary did not stay a virgin. Somebody had a revelation the other day and sent me a message. That I had no idea that Mary had other children. Amen. She had, uh, Jesus had sisters and, and brothers. He, he had step brothers and sisters. That's why I mentioned about Joseph being a stepdad on Sunday and how important it is that if you are a step, if you are a guardian, if you've adopted, amen, you might not have birthed it. You might have not have uh, uh, brought it into the world, but you are assigned to it. Amen. My life, I was assigned to, to a certain group of kids. I'm still assigned to them. So it's important to understand that God did that for, even for Joseph. So in this society, in our society, is very secular. When I say secular, I say liberal. I say uh, the, the, the gospel is not permeating through our colleges. Amen. Secular has everything to do with what's going on the right now. It, it's given a rise to a doctrinal illiteracy among believers and Christians. 
In other words, they, they can tell you uh, certain things, but they can't tell you the books in the Bible. They can't tell you where things are found. They, they don't understand all about the Scriptures. That's why I love sometimes just teaching, just talking to you and try to help you understand. Well, when you look at, again, statistics, 26% believe all religions are basically equal. This comes out of born again. This ain't asking a heathen. This is asking a, a Christian. 26% believe all religions are basically equal. I don't. Amen. 50% believe that good works will get you to heaven. I still hear that out of believers I've pastored for years. They'll say stuff like, well, hopefully I've been good enough. Your good has never been good enough. Amen. I saw a guy the other day had gone through sickness, and he, I mean, he got spanked bad. Uh, and uh, he, he got on, and somebody said, why does good things happen to bad people? And his response was, there are no good people. Amen. Where'd you get the idea we were good? There's no good, none, not, not, no, not one. Amen. There's only, people ask me, Pastor, what you know good? I said, only one. The rest of us need help. Amen. There's nothing good out there. There's nothing good in us. Amen. Except for Christ. Can I get an amen? Amen. 35% do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. How can you be a believer and tell me you don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Uh, 45% do not believe that Satan exists. You don't believe there's a devil? Amen. I, I, want, I, I not only want to believe, I know there's a devil. It's a part of my gospel narrative. I see Satan all through Scripture, amen, manipulating and working against and diabolical what he did. 33% now accept same-sex marriage. And I know that's such a hot topic because, what? first off, we're trying to be tolerant. We're trying to be kind. But on the flip side, God made man and he made woman. Amen. He, those are genders. This new idea about gender identity, it, it tells me that if I think something, that's what I are. Uh, <sighs> Oh, God help me. You see, I'm not, my generation's, I'm going to be dead and gone. I'm not going to be having to deal with this. But your kids and your grandkids will. Amen. My kids and my grandkids will. They have to deal with this, this nonsense. Amen. And I believe it's satanic. I believe it's, it's, it's diabolical. Uh, I believe it, it, it's frustrating. It's, it's confusing. Amen. And I don't want to go into the sexual parts of it, but all this has to do with, with a, a sexual deviancy. Amen. To want to go that way. I just saw where a, uh, um, a man who had been swimming in, uh, and I forgot, uh, UPenn is the name of the university. He'd been swimming there for three years as a man in college. Last year, decided he's going to be a girl. He, he competed against the girls and broke all their records. He stood up there six foot four, hands in the air like he'd done something big. And I thought, somebody need to beat that boy in a man's bathroom. Can I get an amen? All right, yeah, I said it. So it's strong evidence of how American Christianity is conforming to the dominant secular culture. We, we start moving that direction. And, and it's, you know, it, it is all right to be religious according to their dictates as long as your faith exists in your head. But once you start acting on your faith and your hope that you know that Christ's birth, his, his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and you understand all that and you can give an answer for that, now you become what is known as to be intolerant. Now, see, we talked about tolerance all ago, but now you're going to be intolerant. As a matter of fact, can I tell you this? To, to, to believe otherwise than what our secular society believes uh, makes you an intolerant menace to society. And that's what I've been for 40 years, an intolerant menace to society. Amen. That somehow society struggles with the way I think, but I don't care because I'm a man with an experience, and a man with an experience is never at the mercy of somebody with an argument. Amen. They have arguments all day long about what they think, believe. But I know what he did in my life. He meant, and I stand with that. So Christmas is so important at this time. And, and, and I think at times we need to defend our hope. We need to defend his birth. Amen. And everything is different now that Christ is coming to the world. Everything changed. Everything shifted. Amen. There were claims as I walked through. And I don't know if these are on there, sis, but a, an angel visited a virgin. There it is. Look at this. And I, th these are the claims relating to Christmas. An angel visited a virgin who became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The baby in her womb was the Son of God from heaven. Watch. Keep going. God caused a heathen imperial to call for a taxation that sent Mary and Joseph back to Bethlehem at the very moment Jesus was born. Wow, what a coincidence, huh? Amen. Prophets foretold both the virgin birth, that's Isaiah 7, 14, and his birth in Bethlehem hundreds of years before it happened. What did they call it? Out of, out of Bethlehem and then Nazareth. We talk about the sprout, amen, the sprig, the puppy. 
on Sunday, a star led the Magi, the wise men, from the east directly to the house where Jesus was. Wow, did all that happened. Even the slaughter of the infant boys of Bethlehem fulfilled ancient prophecy. When aged Simeon held baby Jesus in his arm, he prophesied about his death on the cross. He said, this child will cause a falling and rising of many in Israel. It, it, he's going to break your heart, Mom. I mean, no mama wants to walk out of a, a, a maternity place and hand her baby to a preacher, and the preacher look at her and say, Mama, this baby going to cause a lot of trouble for you. Amen. Until you understood what he was going to do. He was going to divide darkness from light. Amen. He was going to send evil running. Can I get an amen? Amen. So when I walk through that, I realize, you know, just what a powerful things that happened. And then there are the names that are given out of the book of Isaiah. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, savior, Emmanuel, God with us, son of the most high, Christ the Lord. When you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see a wonderful counsel. A man who counseled the 12, a man who counseled Mary. He really had to counsel Martha. Amen. A man who, who did great, a mighty God, raised the dead. Amen. He helped the lepers out. He showed the power of God, everlasting Father. Amen. Prince of peace. When he would heal people, he'd often tell them, go in peace. Amen. It's amazing how sickness can cause disturbance inside of us. And amen. But when, when it's over with, it's peaceful. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Savior. He saved people. He said in First Timothy, he came to save sinners. That was his passion to come and do. And God with us, the Son of the Most High, Christ the Lord. So then there are the things that he will accomplish. He'll save. Again, this is out of First, uh, first, P, first Timothy. Joseph and I read it today. He'll save his people from their sins. He says it's a faithful saying. He came to save sinners. That's why he showed up. He will reign from David's throne in Jerusalem, and his kingdom will never end. That means we win. Amen. So I close with Luke chapter 2, verse 8. It says, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Uh, some of y'all like camping, and some of y'all like glamping. Most folk I find in our church like glamping. Amen. They, they buy an RV that costs almost as much as their house. Amen. And pull it somewhere and camp somewhere, they call it. You know, and, and they're watching color TV. And, amen. And just enjoying. And I ain't against that. You know, I've, I've had to glamp for months after the hurricanes. That's what I ended up living in, thank God. But can you imagine living in the fields? I mean, you, you had to take an animal to eat. Uh, you, you lived there. You probably had no opportunity for bathing. Amen, and, and you're out there, and, and I, I know I got some deer hunters in here and folk that like hunting and stuff. They ain't nothing like sitting in the quiet of a deer stand. I mean, it, it's quiet. The storms have already come through. Wind's not blowing. And all of a sudden, you hear a twig snap, and everything inside you comes to alert. I mean, Almost to a place of getting a rash. I mean, you just, it just, it just, you just, you grab the gun, you hold and then, and, and you hear that snap again. And you, just, and you just, you, you anticipate, you know, that there's something out there. To live at night outside and to hear the snap. You ain't deer hunting now, something hunting you. That's all changed for you. These guys are living outside. I just want you to keep that in mind. They keep a watch over their flocks at night. What are they keeping watch for? So no animals, no wolves can come and take the flock. So they're watching for it. They don't have a Henry rifle. They got a staff. Amen. They might have a sling, but they, they, they're going to have to have the boldness to chase whatever it is away that's coming into there. These men are protectors. These men are guardians of a sheepfold. Amen. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. What the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Now, I always found this humorous. This is so funny to me that if an angel, if you're sitting around a fire at night and you're watching over the sheep and you're looking out for wolves and all of a sudden something comes from above and comes down in front of you, and, of course, in our minds, figuratively, we always see dressed in white, shining, and, you know, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, levitation, you know, the hovering over you like some drone. 
and looks down at you and says, hey, don't be afraid. What do you expect me to be? I'm going to be afraid. Amen. I'm going to be nervous about what's fixing to go on here. This, this is a little bit scary if you ask me. Amen. But he said to them, don't, don't, the angel said that, to, don't, don't be afraid. I've got good news for you. If there's one thing we need today is good news. Just some good news. Amen. As a matter of fact, good news is great joy. Look, we've waited, we'll wait 363 days. How many days in a year? Five. See, 364 years. It's 364 days. <coughs> a long week. 364 days for that Christmas. These guys have been waiting 400 years. Some of them have been waiting thousands. We've had 80 years since Pearl Harbor, which seems like an eternity. These guys have gone generation after generation waiting on the promise that a virgin will give birth to a child, and that child's name will be Emmanuel, who saves people from their sin. And now the announcement comes to these shepherds out in the field. Amen. It shows that this is that hope that we have. When he showed up, he gave them hope, and he said to them, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Great joy, the word great joy actually is the word mega joy. Amen. It's as big a joy as you can have. It's overwhelming excitement. Amen. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. That's Bethlehem. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Of course, you've read in the King James swaddling clothes. Amen. And and uh, Pastor Mike was telling me, that, and I was trying to catch it. It's a little bit thick for me to listen to, but he's telling me about swaddling clothes has a lot to do with the sacrifice, sacrificial lambs in a certain area. And so when the word swaddling was used, they knew that where they were stored, and it would be at a barn, Bethlehem. So that's why when they said the word swaddling clothes, they understood that, so they knew exactly where to go. Because you couldn't just run into a city. If I told you right now there's a virgin being born in Crosby, go find it. I mean, a virgin is giving birth to a baby in Crosby. Go find it. You wouldn't know whether to go to Walmart, to go to Hunger Jack. Is it over at Arlen's? Where, where would I go? But when the word swaddling came about, it had to do with a certain location where certain clothing was used, amen, during the time of the sacrificial lambs. Now, you have to look that up, but it made good sense to me because then they went there and they found, amen, that this baby, hallelujah, wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company, the heavenly host, appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. The question is to me has always been, uh, one angel got there first, and then the rest of them showed up. Did you ever think about this? Why, why didn't they all go together? Or did one jump the gun? Amen. Hallelujah. He left heaven a little bit earlier than the rest. And then the rest of them got there and started singing, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men, on whom his favor rests. When I read that, amen, I, I can imagine how these shepherds felt at that moment that they were, um, they got to shake hands with heaven. Amen. They saw aliens. Hallelujah. They saw something from another world, another kingdom. It, it, it addressed them, knew who they were. Amen. Gave them permission to give the proclamation that the Son of God had come to earth. Hallelujah. So this was great joy for these shepherds. And again, it didn't, wasn't announced anywhere in a, in a palace, but here at this moment, great joy. Hallelujah. To you, in the middle of whatever your pain and difficulty, anger, frustration, sin, or failure, to you today a Savior has been born. Amen. And that's the beauty. I I did a little video today for a young man who I remember back when we were, when I was in Channel View as a youth pastor and first starting in Crosby, and he was probably three or four years old when I met. He's 40 years old now, getting ordained into the ministry, and his pastor called me today and said, would you give a, a message to him because you meant something to him way back in the day as his pastor and you took care of his family. Amen. I read that, and I thought to myself, I remember this kid. He, he was a heathen. He was a mess. And now he's 40 years old, facing to get ordained into the ministry. Amen. His whole life's turned around. He, he's a drummer. He's a worship leader. Amen. He's a preacher. And I'm so honored. 
and that they would send me the message and say, hey, would you say something about this guy? So when I read this today, a Savior, we need a Savior. Amen. You may not see the promise fulfilled, but you, you see the promise present. Amen. The call is to rejoice. And there at the foot of the cross, we come and receive the ultimate gift of eternal life. So we go back to Peter again and remember the hope that lies within you, that that baby that was born was born in the shadow of that cross. Amen. And even Simeon, and we'll talk as we move through this to the next few weeks. We'll add a little bit more, a little bit more. But people who know the eternal truth of God's word, they celebrate with joy. Amen. I'm reminded there will come that day that God will take me out of this place. And uh, the older I get, the less stress I am about it. Amen. The ones I care for are the ones that will be left here. But when I'm gone, I don't think I'm going to have to care. It won't bother me. So I, I, again, I started releasing things out of my life. I told you Sunday I had a dream. Amen. I saw something in a dream. I Manif that dream manifested in my life to be a blessing to a couple people, and I blessed them this week. Amen. And they said, why are you doing this? I said, because I had a dream, and y'all were in it, and y'all have no business being in my dreams. Amen. But, but God told me to be a blessing to you, so I'm going to do it. Hallelujah. So I got to be, be careful who shows up in your dreams. Amen. Amen. I've got to have you bless them. So today we say this is how we defend the gospel. I gave you a lot of truth tonight. Amen. I pray you take it to heart, gather it into your life, and as we move toward Sunday, and by the way, not discouraged at all tonight about the good things in God. This house was almost full Sunday. Amen. I looked around. And I see God. You just, you just keep. What you up to? I ask. What you up to? Amen. Just want to be around long enough to find out what it is. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I love you. HD, you come and close us in prayer. Amen. It's your prayer night. I just interrupt. You. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you tonight. Lord, I thank you for the word. <laughs> thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you and I praise you. I thank you, Lord, for the word to you. need to be able to one comes to us. We need to know enough spirit, Father, to be able to tell them about why you Pray, Lord. Christmas rolls, Father. Love you tonight. I pray you, everybody, stay forward. Glory and honor. Precious name of Jesus.